Yeah, the qu- they are day and night. I mean, 5-MeO DMT. Uh, some people like it. Uh, it's a feeling. Is what it's been for me. It's this huge feeling that kind of sweeps through you, and and it's velvety, and it's it's hard to describe actually. But the main thing that I'm noticing when it's happening is I am not hallucinating, and of course the main thing that's happening with DMT is you're having hallucinations so intense, so three-dimensional, so highly colored, so sculpturally defined that it's more real than reality. And by that I mean, if you look at this room, notice how all edges are slightly feathered. There is, at all boundaries, a slight indeterminacy. But on DMT, it's hard-edged. Everything is just defined. Sometimes people say it's as though all the air had been pumped out of the room. You're seeing it with that lunar starkness and clarity, you know. And unimaginable objects, objects off the art scale and uh, entities. DMT is the only one of these psychedelics where I have seen the entities. Uh, on psilocybin, it speaks, and it's audio. On DMT, it's it's um, you see these things, and uh, I don't know whether it's my personal mythology. For me, DMT is the center of the mystery. I mean, I fear it, I love it, I thank God for it. Uh, I wonder if I'll ever understand it. It takes a huge mustering of courage on my part to do it because I, it just is so, I mean, we talk, 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 change, transformation, other dimension. This is not talk when you do that. I mean, you just do not know the parameters. I feel like I know more about what could happen to me if I'm in the Amazon jungle than I know what could happen to me when I'm in that place. And after many, many DMT trips, I've finally been able to paint a picture for myself of what is happening in there and what happens for me. And I don't know anybody who's done it as much as I have. I wish people did it more and talked more about it because, boy, if there is a landscape where we need some consensus, this is it. I have uh, been present when people did it and they come back babbling about the same thing that I think I have encountered. I mean, they come back and and one woman said um, it was a carnival. It was a carnival of, it was an extraterrestrial midway. And somebody else came back and said there were, there were gnomes, there were elves. And yeah, this is getting close to it. I mean, what happens to me when I do it is um, I convey, there's a period, an initial period of kind of hysteria and confusion. It's almost as though time speeds up, even before you take the first hit. Many people say, just before you do DMT, there's this funny kind of impression in the room, almost as though there is backwash from the event about to happen. You're caught in the, in the, in the psychic field of this event and everything is moving faster and faster. This is like the Q phenomenon. And then you take the hit and it's building up in your body and your heart is pounding and everything. And then you break through to this place. And what it's like is there, the first impression is of a loud, well, the first impression is of the sound of cellophane being crumpled that crackling sound as if someone had just taken a bread wrapper. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Crackle that cellophane for us. (laughs) That's it. More of that. (laughs) 
country is there yet. <laughs> Would that it were so easy. Uh, a friend of mine says that's the sound of the radio intellecti of your soul tearing out of the organic envelope. <laughs> Which is what it sounds like. It sounds like your body has just been wadded up and thrown into a corner, and now you're a radio signal, approximately four light seconds in diameter, spreading out through an alien universe. And the next impression is of a cheer. It's hurrah, welcome, welcome. And it's them, and they're waiting, and they just, they can hardly wait. I mean, they, there's a moment when they're not on me, a, a, just a moment. And then they say, you're here, we're glad to see you, why did you stay away so long? And then they come toward me, and uh, the main thing for me in the DMT thing is to struggle not to go into shock of wonder, basically, I mean, because there is a tendency, a strong tendency, and for the first few trips, I couldn't conquer it. I was just, I was a victim of it. I mean, I just go into this. You know, and I would say, you know, heart, heart, okay. Breathing, breathing, okay. And I'm just, but I'm looking, and I can't believe my eyes, because they're, I'm in some kind of domed place. And the impression, don't ask me why, but the impression is of being underground, even though it's a huge vaulted space and uh, highly colored. And then, but what is, of course, riveting my attention are these beings. And they're small and they're like, I've described them as uh, machine elves. They seem partially machine-like and partially elf-like. Yeah, no, they are not so mundane as that. They don't have a fixed body outline. And in fact, that's one of the things that's going on in this space that's so baffling. They come toward you. They're singing in this alien language, which you somehow understand. It cannot be translated into English but you understand it in that moment. And what they're doing is they are using their voices to produce objects. And so song becomes thing. And there are dozens of these things. And they're coming closer and closer. And the songs they sing condense into objects. And the objects themselves can sing. And... and these things come and they're saying, look, look, and they're holding this stuff out to you. And you look at it and you're fighting wonder because your entire being is caught up in this can't be happening. And yet they're saying, you know, just look. And what, it, and what these things are, are devices, toys, works of art, objects, but whatever they are, they are amazing. And you look into it and you can't, and, and they seem to be shifting. Even though they're made of metal and glass and gems and pulses, everything is migrating and shifting and changing. And they make, they say, look at this one. It's the most astonishing thing you've ever seen. And you just look at it from, and they say, look at this one. Look at this one. And they're piling up. And these things are coming towards you, and then they jump through you. They can pass through your body. And they're running around, chirping and singing and making these objects. And what they're doing is they are saying, do what we are doing. Do what we are doing. And you say, you know, I just want to go back to New York. <laughs> later for that. <laughs> and the implication is, and I'm still, this is the mystery of my life, I'm teasing it out, trying to understand it, but the implication is, and the promise is, that ahead of us in time, six months, 50,000 years, is 
a visible linguistic channel of communication that the thin channel of audio communication composed of small mouth noises is just a provisional kind of communication. And what is being proposed in this state is a true telepathy. Now, we always thought, or I always thought, that telepathy means you think, I hear what you're thinking. What it actually turns out to be is you speak, I see what you mean. And I don't mean that metaphorically. I mean I see what you mean. So that your linguistic intentionality condenses as a three-dimensional object in front of us, a sculptural modality. So then we both see what you mean. You made it, and I'm your uh, conversational cohort, and we're both looking at your meaning. And we can walk around it, we can adjust it, and notice that no common dictionary is necessary here. If you're Witoto and I'm Polish, I still see what you mean. Because what you mean is an objectified three-dimensional modality, not a string of Witoto words. So that, and, and it's saying, do this. Do what we are doing. Well then, I, I, this took me about 15 trips to get this far. And then I began to experiment with sounding in that state. And I discovered that they were right. That, mm, is a three and a half foot wide, eight foot long, magenta curved surface with lime auras. And that mm, shifts the lime auras into rose pink and adds gray silver pinstriping along one edge. And I thought, you know, my God, what is this? So then when you break out into actual chanting, actually linguistically modulated sound, you discover you too can make these objects. And what they apparently are, how this could be, don't ask me, they are apparently a syntactical sculpture. Sculpture made of syntax. Syntax suddenly becomes not the rules that govern spoken languages, but the rules that govern the assembly of three-dimensional thought objects. And uh, as the words were the shadows of hyperdimensional intentions that can actually be broken through to. Well, my God, I just thought this is the weird, this takes the cake. I mean, I've never heard of such a thing. Nobody's ever suggested to me this is possible, so forth and so on. So then, as is the case with most things, if you look long enough, you discover precursors. And what I discovered in a wonderful book, and any one of you would love this book, I'm sure, it doesn't deal with the psychedelic experience by name, but it is a psychedelic book. It's called The Phenomenon of Life by Hans Jonas, J-O-N-A-S. And if you can find this book, what a read. It's a group of essays. And one of the essays, he is talking about um, the etymology of the word Israel. And he says, following Talmudic uh, uh, thinkers, that Israel means he who sees God that this is the actual etymological basis of the word Israel. So then, uh, did I say that we're talking now about the writings of Philo Judaeus? Yes. Philo Judaeus, in discussing the etymology of the word Israel, says it means he who sees God. And then he says, what does this mean, he who sees God? Well, as you probably know, in the Hellenistic world, there was this phenomenon called the Logos. And the Logos was an informing internal voice that tells you the right way to live. It's like a, a spirit ally that speaks to you and informs you. So Philo Judaeus said, what would be the more perfect Logos? 
And then he goes on to answer his own question. He said the more perfect logos would go from being heard to being beheld without ever crossing over a quantized moment of distinct transition. This is precisely and in fact what is going on in in these states. Uh, Because now I have learned or have found out how to evoke this DMT phenomenon in a more con- in the more controllable environment of the psilocybin intoxication and it happens like this first of all i form the wish for it to happen i usually follow a a line i learned in an old i love lucy rerun where she's explaining to ethel how she contacts flying saucers And she says, I just say, come in, little green men, come in, little green men. So on mushrooms, I do this. I say, come in, little green men. And what begins to happen is uh, this sound like bells, like very distant bells. And then it becomes louder and louder. It's sort of like bells with wind. And it becomes louder and louder and more complicated and more complex. And at a certain very, very hard to precisely define moment, it begins to spill over into the visual cortex. And then I see the language and I can, uh, I can interact with it. Well, it is apparently a more perfect logos. This is what I had in mind in the back of my mind yesterday. Remember when I talked about how smoking was new to Europeans and they couldn't understand what it was and then I made this offhand comment that it was a new use for the human body, only 500 years old? Well, it proves that there may be undiscovered uses for the human body. I mean, we've only been around playing with our bodies for 50,000 years and we've discovered most sexual configurations and all these acrobatic things and amazing things that people can do like make pyramids of 10 individuals and so forth. But smoking is pretty basic and yet only 500 years old. Well, it seems to me that right under the surface of human neurological organization is a mode shift of some sort that would make language beholdable and that if we could somehow kick over into this alternative mode, we would become unrecognizable to ourselves. Now, I realize this sounds pretty far-fetched, but you always have to have reference to context. In a universe where there were no people, that would be a pretty far-fetched idea. But the fact that we already possess language seems to argue that we are in the process continually of evolving new applications for our bodies. And that when language, spoken language, burst on the scene 35,000 years ago, which is most estimates, I mean, think of it. 35,000 years ago, people invented language. What must it have seemed like to them? It must have seemed like a miracle. What it, Hardly anything sets you up for it. I mean, the difference between a nine-hour recitation of oral poetry and three chickadees on a line is quite a leap. And I'm suggesting that somehow there could be a leap forward in the communication dimension And that this is, in fact, what shamanism is all about, what the end of history is all about, what psychedelic drugs are all about. We are edge-walking on an ontological transformation of what it means to be human. And the, the mode that this transformation will come in, it will not be political or technological. It is, it isn't starflight. It isn't socialism. It's a whole other way of making our minds known to each other by being able to show each other our minds. And in psychedelic states, 
you can do this. Yeah. Any relationship to the uh, Australian Aboriginal belief that the world that the forefathers actually sung the world into being that the song that whole, that concept doesn't seem too far off. That's right. Well, yes, as you say, in our own tradition, in Principio et Verbum, et Verbo caro factum est, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was made flesh. That's the whole story. What we need to do is pass through this transition and make the word flesh. In other words, objectify the word. Somehow the word, and I, believe me, I, I talk about these things, but the pictures are provisional. I don't understand how it could be done. I mean, I'm an engineering type on one level. Is it an acoustical hologram? How in the world could I make you see a concept in my mind as though it were hovering three feet above the floor? Is there a way? And I've noticed on psychedelics, and again, I, I don't know whether this is a false trail or whether this is part of the mystery, but I've noticed on psychedelics that if you get it, um, a candle... If you get a person between yourself and a candle so that you have them in profile and they are raving and you can see the candle past them, there's something coming out of their mouth. It's like, um, you know how when you agitate oil in water and you see the swirling oiliness of water, or when you're in a swimming pool with too much suntan lotion in it, there's this kind of roiling uh, discontinuity in it that's fairly subtle. Well, something like that is in the middle of my field of vision, and I'm just watching them, and they stop dead. These two people, they must be 500 yards away, 1,500 feet away over these rolling green lawns, they stop dead and then they scan and then they start toward me and I cannot believe my eyes that these people have changed course 90 degrees and are now headed right for me <laughs> and, they, and I kept telling myself it's a hallucination it's a lo an illusion they are not getting larger in your field of vision you are not going to have to confront these people please God make it so <laughs> No reprieve. They're just getting larger and larger and larger until, and so I said, I'm going to make this go away by not looking, and I'm just going to sit like this. And I sat like this, not moving, until the guy's feet <laughs> entered my field of vision. And then I just, and then I didn't move, and I didn't say anything, and then I just looked up, and he said, you are from which place? <laughs> you have been how long in India? And it was the grilling, which any Indian tourist knows. Any citizen of the subcontinent can approach you any time of the day or night, anywhere, demand to know your name, how long you've been in this country, and then the kicker. And what do you think of India? <laughs> And this question is asked for the specific purpose of observing your discomfiture because they know damn well what you think of India. And uh, so <laughs> I, I just, I looked up and I gave this guy my most penetrating gaze and I said, I cannot be interrogated. And then I just put my head down <laughs> and waited, I don't know, an hour. And when I looked up, they were gone. But uh, only in that circumstance of being so stoned would I have ever behaved that way. Because the normal tourist reaction is, and they watch this happen to you, you just go into a tailspin of, it's their country, everybody's a person, I'm a stranger. I should be nice. They're harmless. What's so bad about this anyway? And then, you know, and so then you, you pair it out. You explain. I'm from San Francisco, California. I've been here three months, so forth and so on. 
a friend of mine told me a funny story about taking the Bombay, Calcutta mail and arriving in Calcutta on this train four o'clock in the morning and he gets off the train and there's a little sadhu man over there and the guy starts toward him and comes up to him and my friend said, wait a minute, before you say a word, my name is Nathan Jones, I'm from Brooklyn, New York, I've been in India three and a half months and I hate it. <laughs> and the guy said, oh, you're a great Baba. You're reading my mind. You're reading my mind. <laughs> you got to be fast. That's all there is to it. Yeah. Uh, over, the, over the last couple of days, you've you said that the mushroom basically creates its own agenda. You've also given an example of how you've directed it. So which of those is true? And if you can direct it, are there ways to direct it to specific regions by doing specific things? What kind of a region? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you... Okay, well, the first thing is, do the mushrooms have their own agenda? And second of all, if, if you have some control over it, how do you get to where you want to go? Uh, whether you want to deal with certain issues like death or the body or whatever, or to get to certain regions of, of consciousness? Well, it has its own agenda in that it has this, it, it has certain qualities, this extraterrestrial outer space, a planetary history is ending, apocalypse millennia kind of thing. You can uh, direct it if it likes the way you're going. It's sort of like a, a very a, a strong horse. You know, if you're going the way it wants to go, you're fully in control. Uh, otherwise, not. Uh, I mean, I can remember situations with mushrooms where I hadn't taken it for a long time and I fall into confusion and it usually revolves around, am I doing the right thing, whatever the right thing is. So then I'll take mushrooms and wait until properly, so, and then put this question, am I doing the right thing? And uh, it, it reminds me of uh, a... Um, press conference that Lyndon Johnson had once, shortly after he became president, somebody asked a question that he didn't care for, and he said, what kind of a chicken shit question is that to ask the president of the United States? So when I go to the mushroom and say, you know, am I doing the right thing? It basically said, what kind of a chicken shit question is that to ask me? <laughs> and I think that was a very good answer. That was what I needed to hear, you know. I mean, are you kidding? <clears throat> So, you know, it can be, you know, my father used to say you can drive a horse to water, but a pencil must be led. And I think that that's sort of the situation uh, with the mushroom. If the question pleases it, it will answer. If the question doesn't please it, you'll, you'll hear about it. And it, it is amazing how it gives people what they need. You know that Rolling Stone song, you don't always get what you want, you get what you need? Uh, I have a friend, dear friend, but arrogant, no doubt about it. This guy is arrogant. He definitely thinks he has his the truth by the throat in most <laughs> situations. And he won't take mushrooms because it gives him such a hard time. You know? oh. I mean, and it says, you know, you're arrogant. You want to know what we do to arrogant people? <laughs> For God's sake, lift it off me. <laughs> So a certain amount of uh, a certain amount of humility. It's a relationship, like to a crusty Zen master or something like that. And it is really like another entity because you cannot predict the answers. I mean, I remember a, a dialogue that I had with the mushroom early on, where I said, uh, "What are you doing?" 
on this planet. And it said, uh, you're a mushroom, you live cheap. <laughs> <laughs> and so he said, huh. He said, listen, this neighborhood was not so bad till the monkeys moved in. <laughs> To you, it may look like a mess. To me, it was paradise. <laughs> the mushroom is very, very weird. I, uh, I'll tell one more story, then I'll try and get off stories. But And all these stories, why am I doing all these uh, dialogue? Uh, but why am I doing all these ethnic imitations? I'm not <laughs> sure. There's one in this story, too. I was in Malibu with all these fancy film people. And uh, we went out to dinner. Ralph Abraham was there, too. And uh, there was this French woman there, a film producer. And she was seated next to me at dinner. And before dinner, we had been uh, talking about the mushroom. Or I had been introduced to her as the mushroom man and this and that. <laughs> and she said to me, um, and you'll see why the story I just told relates to this, the story about you're a mushroom, you live cheap. Um, and she said to me at dinner, she said, you say that the mushroom speaks to you, but I do not understand exactly how this works. And I said, well, it's sort of like uh, uh, it has many faces that it can show. Like sometimes it's like uh, the role that Rod Steiger played in The Pawnbroker. And at that precise instant, Steiger shows up at the table to shake hands with everybody and slap a few backs, and then he just drifts off into the recesses of this restaurant. And Ralph Abraham, who was sitting across the table from me watching this whole thing and had heard what I said to this woman, reached across the table to me and said, you see, the mushroom is showing us that it can touch us anywhere, anytime. <laughs> Strange stories. Synchronicity. Yeah. Yeah. How do you remember to bring back what you've learned? Oh, that's a good question. That's, a, that's an important question. That's a key question. Um, Roland Fisher, who was a great psychedelic researcher with psilocybin and later <clears throat> retired to Majorca to be Robert Graves' next-door neighbor, coined the phrase state-bounded. This means you can't bring it back. And I'm sure you all have had the experience of dreaming, being caught up in some incredible dream with strange people, foreign countries, exotic costuming. The alarm goes off, and as you stagger out of bed, this is just melting like an ice cube in a blast furnace. And by the time you're out of bed and fully dressed, you have nothing, not a shred, not a hint, not a clue. It's absolutely gone. This is a state-bounded memory. Chemically, what's going on is apparently short-term memory transcription is just not occurring. You're having the immediate impression of these things happening, and then it's not, it's not going to disk, so to speak. It just is lost.